Welcome back to MMA Al Dente. I am the guy who picked Israel Adesanya to dominate Sean Strickland. He's going to dominate him. What do you think, this potting, boxing shit's going to work against a striker the caliber of Adesanya? Think again. And he doesn't have power, Strickland. Not the power to make anything happen. He will not have one big moment in this fight. Mark my words. All right. I am here to recap UFC 293. I will start with Sean Strickland beating Adesanya, and I will wrap up with Kevin Jusse beating Kiefer Crosby. And I know how badly you want to hear all about that, so uh, tune into the whole video. Sean Strickland beats Adesanya. This was incredible. One of the biggest upsets ever. One of the finest performances ever. And certainly, maybe, maybe not the absolute last thing I expected, but yeah, this wasn't a possibility. Even if I speculated on Strickland could win a decision. He's a good point fighter in the pre-fight video. I think I articulated my points pretty well. I thought Adesanya was just a horrible matchup for him. And in retrospect, I really think Sean Strickland is a horrible matchup for Adesanya. Horrible. I thought he was going to play right into Israel Adesanya's hands and it went the exact opposite way. There was this narrative in the post-fight, you know, I watched the post-fight with all the commentators and uh, the analysts back at the desk, as they say, and whatever the fuck, and there was this narrative going around that Israel Adesanya was off. I don't think he was off, and if he was off, he was thrown off by the big punch at the end of round one and the subsequent ground or er, left hooks against the cage. Uh, I don't think he, he knocked Adesanya down, but I don't think he landed one strike on the ground. But that, if anything, took Adesanya out of his element. But even that I'd argue against by saying Adesanya looked back to form in round two, uh, where, you know, he looked really good. Obviously the best he looked in that whole fight, because that's the only round he clearly won. And let me say that I was sure that it was 4-1 to one out of uh, Strickland after the bell. I don't think there was one round that was up for dispute. You know, maybe there was, maybe the third round was close or whatever. I don't remember, but I know I had Sean Strickland winning 4-1, to one, and I was very sure all three judges would score it that way. Strickland was just too much for Adesanya. He was, as Laura Sanko pointed out throughout the fight, really towards the end of the fight, he was too sound defensively. And credit to her, because that was the story of the fight. He was too sound defensively. Adesanya had every physical advantage and a, an athletic advantage, certainly. Much more agile. And he wasn't able to make it work against uh, Sean Strickland. He was able to u utilize his reach and his height and whatever. But the strikes themselves were not penetrating the guard of Sean Strickland. And, you know, all the defense. You know, the shoulder rolling and whatever the fuck. And the weird fucking Philly shell thing or whatever they say. You know, you can tell I don't know what a box. But Sean Strickland does. And he was in Adesanya's face. Forward pressure will always be a half a point on the judge's scorecard. But... There was no need for some difference maker like that. This was Sean Strickland's fight. He wasn't hurt, and he was hurting Adesanya. And not just in round one with that big shot, but getting the better of him, landing the more powerful shots. And uh, Adesanya was moving well, but you know he needed to throw back. And because of that, it, it's not like he was dancing around Sean Strickland. He was always within range. And Strickland, with the forward pressure, he caught him a few times against the cage, just cornering him. And I thought it was incredibly impressive. I, th I thought uh, this would be the exact opposite fight, where Israel Adesanya was going to be too elusive for Sean Strickland. But in the end, I don't know if I'd say Sean Strickland was elusive, because he was going right at him. But Israel Adesanya couldn't penetrate the guard of Sean Strickland. He said so in between rounds. I can't fucking hit this guy. And Sean Strickland, uh, man, he, he was a bad matchup for Adesanya. This was just incredibly impressive. Not one takedown, no grappling. One big strike in the, the beginning of round one, but largely he dominated this fight and won the points battle pretty damn cleanly too. And against a guy who I think I still feel comfortable saying is the more sophisticated striker, probably I should just say he's the better striker, but Sean Strickland outstruck him. 
And Sean Strickland, as he said in his post-fight press conference and interview and whatever, he is a very, very good striker. Guy's comfortable boxing with some of the best boxers, he says. I don't know who these guys are, but uh, he's very comfortable. And that's another point I wanted to make. He is more comfortable in a fight than maybe anybody, Sean Strickland. And it's because he spars like crazy. That's his reputation, and he'll say so himself. Chris Curtis, his buddy, will say so. The guy just lives to spar. And there are definitely some uh, detriments to that, you know, especially if you get knocked down enough or whatever. I feel like it's just, uh, you know, a short path to the end of your career there. But for some guys, whatever, they stay healthy, and it's just a distinct advantage that they're much more comfortable under fire. And... Look, I'm not saying Israel Adesanya can't handle fighting or whatever. I don't know what point I'm trying to make here. But the point I think I'm trying to make is that Sean Strickland is very fucking comfortable under fire. He has He's at home in the cage. He's not at home doing stare downs. I mean, I uh, my friend was telling me that he thought Sean Strickland was scared in the stare downs. And even on his walk out to the octagon last night. Guy's not scared, or even if he is, it's like some Diaz thing. Yeah, the Diaz's are scared. Just go hit one in the face, and then they'll be able to fight for 25 minutes if need be. They're just natural fighters. And Sean Strickland is a natural fighter. And maybe it's not so natural, but he's conditioned himself through, through sparring, where at this point it is his nature. But the guy is just so comfortable in there, and he became himself... Uh, pretty quickly, he realized he was going to be leading the dance. I think by round three, he thought, yeah, I've got this guy. And you saw him gaining more confidence. Stalking is he? And uh, even in round five, talking shit. And it was just uh, an incredible performance from Sean Strickland. One of the coolest upsets I've ever seen. And this guy... I always thought of him as a good fighter, but middle of the pack welterweight. You know, he came to the UFC, I think he was a middleweight for a few fights, but then largely spent five plus years at welterweight and had good results, but still a few losses and whatever. And then he was out with an injury for two years and came back as a middleweight. And it was like I had forgotten about him when he came back to fight Jack Marshman. And that was in the apex, no people there, and he was talking shit. And he gained everybody's attention. And it was like he was a new fighter. And, of course, he started running his mouth ever since then. But much like Chael Sonnen back in 2009, uh, running his mouth, it's cool on its own, but it's incredible when you're winning fights, especially against some of the greatest fighters. Chael beat uh, Yushin Okami and Nate Marquardt back-to-back -to, -back to get his fight, uh, his fight with Anderson Silva. And Sean Strickland, I know he lost to Cannoneer and Alex Pereira. And the guys he beat were uh, unranked, some of them even, or whatever. But he, uh, first of all, he arguably won the Cannoneer fight. But even against uh, Nasruddin Imabov and uh, Abusupian Magomedov, Sean Strickland excelled in these fights against these dangerous guys that were, you know, maybe not ranked and certainly not respected as like uh, Nate Marquardt and Yushin Okami were for Chael. But... Uh, Sean Strickland was a cowboy stepping up fighting these guys that nobody wanted to fight that he shouldn't have taken it was a professional misstep to take on some of these fights but he didn't stop uh, marching forward didn't let that cannoneer loss the term either and in the end taking all these right fights you know or all these wrong fights I guess paid off because he got the leapfrog cannoneer and get this title shot you know, under whatever circumstances, because Drikas Duplessis uh, was injured or whatever. So, he just kept going forward, doing what he needed to do, and if he got any sort of a break, he was there for it, and he did. The stars aligned, he got a shot with Israel Adesanya, and I thought that was his ceiling. I thought I'd say, yeah, Strickland, he main evented a pay-per-view with Adesanya, you know, after it was all said and done, wrapping up his career. Yeah, he made it to a pay-per-view main event where he lost to Israel Adesanya. But uh, still, he had a great career. Nope. He dominated Adesanya and took his middleweight strap. And he didn't do so with one punch. I think it would have been less impressive to just knock him out. 
You know, like out of uh, like uh, Pereira. Not that that wasn't impressive, a fucking fifth round comeback knockout. But uh, I thought Sean Strickland would not be uh, at his usual advantage of being the better point fighter in the fight. I thought he was really up against it there, and that's what made it a horrible matchup. And instead, Sean Strickland wins the world title. Dominates Israel Adesanya, becomes a legend, Hall of Famer, whatever the fuck else he gains from this fight, a fucking millionaire, I'm sure he's already a millionaire, but uh, yeah, he just changed his life and the sport in one of the greatest performances I've ever seen. Uh, this was just an exceptional uh, Sean Strickland fight, and again, the one of the last results I expected, maybe Strickland via submission in round five was my... Uh, you know, least likely result, but all Strickland victories were not likely at all. I thought his best chance to victory was disqualification. So, fucking incredibly impressive. I like the big, the big picture of how he's looked since he came back after that two-year layoff. And like I said, I've been following the sport for a long time, back when he was a welterweight, back since two thousand and fucking two. But Sean Strickland became a star, he jumped on my radar when he came back and fought Jack Marshman in the Apex, and ever since then, he's turned it up, again, much like Chael did in 2009, and parlayed it all, all of his success with all these incredible performances, and now he is a superstar, who is a world champion in the history books, it all fucking worked out, and I couldn't be happier. Just an incredible, incredible story, and MMA is just the fucking best. MMA is the best sport on earth. Nothing even comes close, and I love moments like this. It may not be quite the, you know, Edwards versus Usman type of moment, or Pereira versus Adesanya, but again, this was a much bigger upset than those fights, much bigger, a much bigger surprise, and... Even though he didn't get the finish, and finishes are always better than decisions, winning a decision against Israel Adesanya in a pure kickboxing bout, it just uh, it couldn't be better for the guy. So, I know I repeated myself a lot of times here, as I see that I've been talking for 12 fucking minutes, but uh, just, yeah, I feel like I could never stop talking about Sean Strickland and uh, this, this victory, just an incredible victory. And for Adesanya... He, uh, you know, as they pointed out, he is the most active champion or was the most active champion. This guy has stepped up time and time again. Seems like he's always in great shape and, you know, he uh, always puts it on the line. The way he got that quick turnaround against Alex Pereira might have been a five-month layoff or whatever, but uh, the guy... He is uh, an incredible fighter, balls of steel, a world champion, one of the best of all time, and I'm sure he'll be back in the title scene before you know it, if not in an in immediate rematch, for all I know. I don't know. But yeah, great fucking story. That brings me to Volkov. Alexander Volkov beats Tai Tuivasa with an Ezekiel choke in round two. Fight went about how I expected it to go up until the ground game. You know, Volkov got on top of Tai Tuivasa and just dominated him. Got the full mount pretty quickly and looked really good on top. That was really impressive. I would have thought Volkov was better with the grappling, but it didn't even occur to me. I don't think I broke down any grappling at all in that fight uh, because I was so sure that Volkov would have a distinct advantage on the feet, which is where Tai Tuivasa wants to be. And he, I think he did as well, of course. Looked really good on the feet. Uh, and beating Ty up, stabbing him to the body. But he gets it done with the uh, Alexei Olenek choke in round two from the top. Just uh, an incredible performance from Volkov. He should have won this fight, but I don't know if he should have looked this impressive. This, And, you know, maybe it's not as impressive, but uh, a guy like him getting a submission is always cooler to me than a straight-up TKO which he's done enough of that lately. So, awesome win for him. And for Tai Tuivasa, he's a really game fighter. I think uh, he was really up against it here. And uh, he gave it a good go, but he was just outmatched. You know, Volkov, just on uh, size alone. You know, he's a physical problem that uh, not a lot of people can replicate in the gym. 
and uh, Volkov was just too much for him. But still, really a cool finish for Volkov. That's the story of the fight. My main takeaway is he got a submission. First in the UFC, I believe, and uh, looked incredible doing it. Speaking of looking incredible, Manel Kopp takes on uh, Felipe Dos Santos. This was uh, not dominant. I thought it was 30-27 Kopp. And, I, you know, again, I thought he won all three rounds. But it was an awesome debut for Felipe Dos Santos. Awesome. He is immediately on my radar. My respect for his durability has skyrocketed. And also my respect for his skill set altogether, specifically on the feet. And also his uh, grit. You know, the guy didn't go anywhere. Uh, he got hurt badly by Manel Kopp early. And was largely outgunned, I thought, where Kopp was doing more damage throughout the fight. And I thought that's why he was clearly winning. But Felipe Dos Santos didn't stop battling. Was always trying to make shit work. And just immediately jumped onto my radar. You know, this guy's on my radar. Uh, so much so that I'm talking about him before the guy that won all three rounds. Uh, Manel Kopp. Who looked fantastic as well. I think Manel Kopp. Uh, this, I think this win will get better with age as Felipe Dos Santos gets better with age. He's only 22. I think he actually turned 23, they said. But uh, the guy, I think, will be a phenomenal fighter. And Manel Kopp uh, was too much for him. Barely, but he was too much for him. And now Manel Kopp, I think, has to fight Kai Kara France next based on the shit talking at the press conference and, of course, in the octagon as well. But uh, Manel Kopp is a title contender, in my opinion, you know. Uh, I don't know what's happening with Pantoja and whatever, Brandon Royval maybe, but you plug Manel Kopp into a title fight right now, and I am not going to complain. Guy absolutely belongs, and of course he fought Pantoja. He lost, but uh, took a round from him. But uh, yeah, this was an incredible performance from uh, both guys. But Felipe Dos Santos, that's the story of the fight for me. This guy arrived, I thought he would... I thought he would come out of the gate like a bat out of hell, which he did, and then get tamed by Manel Kopp. And I thought that's exactly what happened at the end of round one, or the middle of round one when he got cracked by that big shot. But that didn't tame him. He was still a wild beast, and he didn't let it discourage him at all. And uh, I thought, you know, again, he just immediately jumped on my radar. Uh, incredible debut, and for Manel Kopp, a win that'll get better with age. That brings me to uh, Justin Taffa versus Austin Lane. Uh, this was pretty quick. This is about how I expected the fight to go. I thought Justin Taffa just had too much power for Austin Lane, who's got a uh, weak chin, in my opinion. Or maybe not a weak chin, but whatever. He's not durable. And Justin Taffa cracked him and sent him flying with a nice combination, a few hooks, and then... Once he was down, he pounced on him. Incredible win for Justin Taffa. Gets the pay-per-view victory at home on, uh, on pay-per-view again. And uh, also some revenge, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Austin Lane did poke him in the eye. And he poked him in the eye again in this one. I forgot about that. But uh, still, the fight went exactly how I expected it to go the first time and the second time. Even though my official prediction was Taffa via triangle choke in round three. Don't forget it. But uh, yeah, Austin Lane, I don't know, I'm sure he'll be given another shot, and he's got a lot of cool, you know, uh, he's got a lot of nice traits as a fighter physically and whatever, but uh, his chin isn't one of them, and his defense isn't one of them. However, that fucking hook kick or whatever he threw in there looked like it could have taken anyone's head off. So hopefully he'll be back, get another shot in the UFC, and bring some more fun, win or lose. But this was the Justin Taffa show, and he looked awesome at home. Great victory. Steamrolled them largely. Speaking of which, uh, Tyson Pedro uh, beat Anton Turcali. I don't know if I'd say he steamrolled him, but he knocked him out in like two minutes. I thought Anton was leading the dance, uh, chopping at Tyson Pedro, and certainly scoring more points. But uh, in the end, points didn't matter. Tyson Pedro cracked him a few times, had him doing the fish dance, and then got him down, well, knocked him down and pounded him out. I think he was unconscious as well. I think he started to go a little stiff. But a great win for Tyson Pedro. Another victory at home in a fight that was very close on paper. Anton Turcali, I really like this guy. But man, I don't know if he's going to be around anymore. 
He's got three losses in the UFC. I think they're forgivable losses, you know, especially that first one with all those circumstances against Jelton Almeida, or Jelton Almeida. But, uh, yeah, three losses, finished twice, and now this one is a major setback because it gives you a concern for his chin. So, uh, moving forward, if he is still in the UFC, there's some major doubts. But for Tyson Pedro, who's already given us enough doubts, he looked really good here. You know, well, maybe not really good, but he got a finish in round one. And, uh, uh, yeah, can't go wrong that with a finish in round one. That brings me to Carlos Olberg versus uh, Dong Jung. And this was a finish in round three, believe it or not. Even though I was sure it was a decision and I went to go use the bathroom and came back to find out that, no, the decision prop did not hit. Dao Jung uh, tapped out with 10 seconds left, which was incredible because the fight did go, you know, the final bell rang. So he tapped out 10, 11 seconds before that, but still made it to the final bell somehow. Uh, but credit to Carlos Olberg. I mean, Olberg definitely won the fight and was going to win the fight anyway. But for the guy to get a rear naked choke under any circumstances is a feather in his cap, a new wrinkle to Carlos Olberg. We've seen him hit takedowns before on uh, Fabio Charant, uh, but that, you know, didn't prove to be, uh, that didn't uh, open up the world to his submission skills or anything. This one did, and in the Charant fight, I believe he started taking him down in round three as well. But here, he was all over Daun Jung and got the strangle, you know, even though it was, uh, he didn't get the crowd roaring with the tap and all that, the real moment you want. He still gets a third round submission victory. One of the last results I expected. I uh, I don't know who I would pick to get the rear naked choke in round three first. But between both guys, uh, just an incredibly rare result in my opinion. And awesome to see Carlos Oberg win like that. I thought if he would have won and I thought he was going to win, it would have been him outpointing Jung to a decision or even more likely knocking him out in round one, which was my pick. I thought he would have knocked him out late in round one. Knocked him down and whatever, but uh, in the end, he gets a rear naked choke. So, fantastic for Carlos Olberg. And that brings me to another weird result, and that would be Chepe Mariscal beats uh, Jack Jenkins. This was unfortunate, really unfortunate. Uh, this was a grimy fight. I thought Jenkins won round one. Round two, of course, was still up in the air. But uh, Chepe Mariscal hit a beautiful throw on Jack Jenkins, and he fucked his arm up like Shogun at the Pride 31. But uh, this was just horrible. I mean, Jack Jenkins, you know, such a good fighter, so much promise, and, you know, again, all up in that fight, at least after round one, in my opinion, and it all comes crashing down, literally, with a big throw from Chepe Mariscal. And, yeah, he fucked his arm up immediately. I knew he wasn't unconscious because he was covering up. But you could see he was fucked. And, yeah, that sucks. But for Chepe Mariscal, this guy's one of my favorite guys to make his debut in the last year or so. And now he's 2-0 and in the UFC. And despite the circumstances, a win over Jack Jenkins looks pretty on his record. And I think it'll look prettier as uh, time goes by. But... With the asterisks or without the asterisks, Chepe Mariscal looked good in there. He was getting beaten up by leg kicks, sure. That's the story of every Jack Jenkins fight, frankly. But he showed no signs of slowing down. And uh, in the end, was uh, working Jenkins in the clinch uh, right before that throw. So maybe they'll rematch one day. I don't know. You know, I don't need to see it. It's not like uh, whatever. And who knows where Jack Jenkins, how long Jack Jenkins is going to be out. But, uh... I'm happy Chepe Mariscal got a win. Really liked this guy. I thought he had an incredible debut with Trevor Peak. And now, again, despite the circumstances and all the horse shit and the asterisk, it is a win over Jack Jenkins. 2-0. and oh, And I uh, can't wait to see him again. That brings me to Jamie Malarkey beating John McDessie by clear decision that there can be no dispute about. All right. It was pretty close. I scored it for McDessie. I thought McDessie outpointed him down the stretch. But Jamie Malarkey, he's, you know, he's a grimy fighter, just, uh, you know, relentless, and he's got the hometown crowd behind him. I expected that to be the difference maker somewhere along the line, and I think this is the fight where you can isolate this fight and say, yeah, it was the difference maker here. 
It was close enough. You know, I wasn't sure anybody got the decision after the bell was uh, announced. The final bell w was rung, but I did think McDessie won. I thought he looked better down the stretch, and I thought Malarkey did not. But Malarkey gets the victory, you know, home cooking or whatever the fuck. But, uh, yeah, it's just another John McDessie fight that was really, really close. He's had plenty of them in his UFC career, and this one was no different. Kind of sucks that it didn't go his way because they thought he really earned it, and he's an older guy, 38 or whatever. Certainly doesn't need the loss, but uh, whatever. This one didn't go his way. Goes to Jamie Malarkey. That brings me to Nazrat Hapkarast versus Landon Quinones. Nazrat Hapkarast... Uh, Domin I, I, no, he didn't dominate Landon Quinones. It was dominant on paper, 30-27, kind of like Cop versus Felipe Dos Santos, but a very similar fight where it was very competitive. I'd even say it was a war. And Nazrat did not have it easy at all. He was busted up. I thought he was hit with some very, uh, some very dangerous shots from Landon Quinones, but Nazrat was the sharper striker. I thought he was faster. Yeah, you know, that left hand is money, as they say in the movie Swingers, anyway. But uh, Nazrat was too much for Landon Quinones with his speed. And I never thought he lost a round. I thought it was pretty close. I thought either guy could get finished. But as far as the points battle goes, I thought Nazrat was definitely leading the dance. And it was his left hand that was the story of the fight. Of course... Uh, Landon was beating up his leg very, very badly, and that took away some of the power of Nazrat as he was square in his stance and even trying to fight conventionally, you know, usually fights a southpaw, but Nazrat was still making his boxing work really well for him, uh, despite having to give up his stance. I thought his left hand was still effective for all three rounds, and his legs, even though you probably can't walk on him right now and he's in a wheelchair or something, he uh, definitely... Uh, protected himself well enough throughout that whole fight. You know, he was forced to switch stances and whatever, but he maintained his danger and, again, consistently outpointed Landon Quinones, in my opinion, with just a little more power and certainly a bit more speed. So, good win for Nazrat. He really earned it. And uh, Landon Quinones will get another shot. I still have some doubts about him, of course, but they're not on the feet, you know, uh... After that Jason Knight defeat. But uh, yeah, uh, he'll be back. And he certainly earned his spot. Because Nazrat Habkarest was a uh, uh, potentially bad matchup for him. Like I said in the pre-fight, was, there was a potential. It was a favorable matchup of all the people that you know would be 5-1 uh, to one favorites over him in the UFC. Because Nazrat will oblige him in a stand-up fight. But uh, Nazrat was just better on the feet. Uh, better on the feet. He did take him down once too briefly, I think. But uh, Landon popped right up. And it was a largely a stand-up bout. And Nazrat was too much for him. So, uh, a war. Close enough fight. But 30-27 Nazrat. Charlie Ratke beats Blood Diamond. This was a uh, one of the shittier fights. You know, they weren't all shit. But this one was... Slower. I think uh, Charlie Radke was better than Blood Diamond, but he was not able to go through him with his grappling like I thought he would. I thought he would go, would have gone right through Blood Diamond, and he did not. Blood Diamond was pretty sound defensively. You know, spent I don't know how many minutes altogether defending takedowns against the cage, but he did a good job. But offensively, he didn't do much, Blood Diamond. Turned it up a little bit in the end, but overall, I thought he was getting, he was in more danger on the feet even. Because Charlie Radke has a tight stance and throws some powerful hooks. And they're all means to an end, of course. You know, he wanted to get Blood Diamond down. But still, I thought he had a shot of knocking Blood Diamond out in the middle of that fight. Blood Diamond, despite looking good in the end, or not good, but, uh, you know, not horrible in the end. And whatever else, and defending the takedowns, he just, he looked like a 35-year-old in there. He looked like the 35-year-old. I think Radke's 32 or 3 or whatever. It's not like he's a spring chicken. But Blood Diamond, uh, yeah, he's just, uh, he's not long for the UFC. In fact, I'm pretty sure he's going to be cut after this one, and we won't see him again. But, yeah, he got into the UFC too late, MMA too late, and credit to him for surviving with a guy who I thought would run through him on the ground, but uh, no credit to him you know, moving forward. I don't think he's going to be in the UFC. And for Charlie Ratke, uh, this was a good 
a good victory, but it is overshadowed by him, uh, whatever. Uh, what do he say? You know, he called the crowd faggots. You know, whatever. I'm, I'm not somebody who's like, oh, we're going to cancel people and whatever. I don't give a fuck. I mean, really. But uh, I think the UFC gives a fuck. So he's got to watch that shit because uh, if he wants to stay in the UFC. And uh, somebody else called someone a fag. Oh, yeah, Manel Cop too. Yeah, he's getting close to a title shot. I don't want to be the guy, oh, you can't say what you want to say. Say whatever the fuck you want. But the UFC wants to project an image out there. And, uh, you know, they don't want their fighters going around, you know, making highlights, calling people faggots and shit. They already got Sean Strickland as their champion. So, thinking on behalf of the company, I think, uh, you know, whatever. They should probably steer away from, you know, like five or six words. Or seven words, maybe, as uh, George Carlin would say. But still... Uh, guy, he's an asshole, and uh, I like that he's got, uh, you know, an attitude and whatever, and he looked good against Blood Diamond. And, of course, Charlie Ratke, as I mentioned in the pre-fight interview, he has an amateur fight where he beat the shit out of some guy from the back mount and then kept punching him. So, you know, maybe I don't like him so much. I think he's a potential asshole. But uh, still, he gave the he gave us a viral moment at the very least last night. That brings me to Gabriel Miranda. Gabriel Miranda beat uh, Shane Young in a minute, or under a minute. This was exactly how Gabriel Miranda wins his fights, but he did it against the highest level opponent he's ever beaten, Shane Young, and he's the first guy to submit him, which is really, really impressive. Shane Young, not that he's some respected jiu-jitsu guy or whatever, but he's had, I don't know how many fights, uh, many, many fights, and he's never been submitted. He's been in there with killers. And Gabriel Miranda runs through him in a minute, took him down, took his back, and strangled him. I thought Shane Young, who missed weight by a few pounds, would have been weaker down the stretch. But I did not think he was going to be steamrolled by Gabriel Miranda like this early. This was no, you know, conditioning issue or weight cut or whatever. This is just what was always going to happen in this fight, in my opinion. You know, I thought uh, Gabriel Miranda could do that. I didn't think he would do that. I was actually siding with Shane Young early. But then Shane Young missed weight, and uh, doubt started to creep in my head. And I thought there was uh, some value on Miranda, as did the public, because they became pretty close to even in odds. But still, to see Gabriel Miranda do what he does on the regional scene against no-name guys and do it in the UFC against Shane Young, it was incredible. This guy, he's got a very forgivable loss in his debut to uh, Benoit Saint-Denis. And now he's got an incredible victory, one of the highlights of the card last night uh, over Shane Young. So uh, Gabriel Miranda is going to be in the UFC for some time. He's earned his keep, and he looked fucking awesome here. And that brings me to Kevin Jusay. Jusay beat Kiefer Crosby. This was a... One ra uh, submission in round one towards the end of round one. He gets his first submission, Kevin Jusse, despite being a judoka first and foremost. It's been all TKOs, even if they're on the ground or whatever. And, you know, some of them are on the feet as well. But here is just too much for Kiefer Crosby. I do think physicality played a difference. I thought he started to uh, rough him up towards the end of round one and was bullying him in the clinch. And, yeah, he just had size and strength and was the bigger man. And when he got on top of Kiefer Crosby, that was it. Uh, took him, took his back and choked him pretty quickly. So, Kiefer Crosby, he looks vulnerable. Like I said in the pre-fight, I think uh, he's a, the more vulnerable guy. And this certainly doesn't help his cause. But Kevin Jusse, he's a, he's a physical beast. Especially compared to a guy like uh, Kiefer Crosby. And even though half his win, or wins are now 4 out of 9, I think, are decisions... He's got some overall danger. On the feet, he's a dangerous guy. And on the ground, uh, it's where where he shines. And uh, he shined here against Kiefer Crosby and largely went right through him. I mean, Kiefer was throwing down early. Kiefer Crosby, you can count on this guy to bring aggression and striking and uh, forward pressure. But he doesn't have the defense of uh, Sean Strickland, I'd say. So Kevin Jusse found his opening and uh, got a first round finish. Makes an incredible debut here. He will be back, of course, and Kiefer Crosby will as well, I'm sure. 
And, uh, you know, with the right matchup, that guy can really shine because he's got a lot of cool traits as a fighter. But overall, the total package, I think uh, there's a lot more upside with a guy like Kevin just say. And, uh, yeah, he proved it last night. Great first-round victory. So, altogether, a very cool event, UFC 293. But the story of this event will always be what happened in the main event. And you know what? It happened, what was it? It was UFC 193, where Ronda lost to uh, Holly Holm. And that was also in Australia as well. And now it's 293. I know they mentioned that Ronda lost in UFC uh, in uh, Australia, but I don't know if they mentioned that it was 193 and now 293. I don't know what the fucking point of all this is. Yeah, they have the same two numbers. Uh, whatever. Uh, real stupid fucking point by me. I kind of wish I had something better to close this video out, but instead it's me rambling about numbers. You know, 193. And at UFC 93, uh, Dan Henderson beat Rich Franklin. Yeah, who can forget that? Like, share, subscribe, all that horse shit, and check out my other videos.